All right. Galatians 5. Galatians 5. We're going to wrap up uh, these, uh, what we started last week. Civil war in the Christian life. I preached this uh, sort of, uh, not exactly like I'm going to do it tonight, but I entitled it Tug of War. I looked at what the flesh is up to, and I looked at what the spirit is up to, and then I looked at what I must be up to. <laughs> so anyway, well, I, that was, I don't know how long ago that was, but uh, anyway, Galatians chapter number five, let me review for a minute. We, we are looking at uh, verses 16 through 26. This is part two of what we started last week. We saw the conflict scene. We, see, we saw conflict here in verses 17 and 18. Verse 17 says, the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. They're contrary one to the other. And uh, so we saw there was a contrast. And then we saw, or a conflict scene, and then we saw the contrast that was given. Now in verses 19 through 23, we looked at those. And uh, well, not all of them, but we looked at part of them. And uh, so we're going to pick it up in verses, uh, let's see, verse number 19. Let's look at verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in the past, in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now we looked at all of those things that were just mentioned last week. And we see this is the result when one is controlled by the old nature. Now look, <clears throat> when you got saved, your old nature didn't go away. You still have it. Don't believe me? Get out in traffic somewhere. Don't believe me? Go to Walmart. That's what, that, that's my problem. <laughs> so anyway, and, well, it's not too bad at times, but uh, I keep saying before I go, I'm going to have patience. I'm going to have patience. I'm going to trust you, Lord. I'm going to trust you. <laughs> and then uh, I can't say that the devil throws something my way, but it's just, uh, it just happens. And uh, I always get into a line that somebody loses their card or the number's not right or this or that. And I'm thinking, oh. And so anyway, I try not to uh, be impatient, but I think the longer that I live, the more impatient I get. All right. So we, we looked at the old nature. Now, what happens to us when we let the new nature dominate us? There's nine things here that's listed. We're going to look at three things that are Godward, three things that are manward, and three things that are inward. So if you're in the habit of taking notes, let's look at the first thing, Godward. We find in verse number 22, the fruit of the Spirit is, here's the first three, love, joy, joy. Peace. Now these are God word, love, joy, and peace. By the way, you cannot love the way God wants you to love apart from God. In fact, the Bible says that the love of God is shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Ghost. You can't love like Jesus love apart from having Jesus in you, uh, having the life of Jesus. So if we're going to love like we ought to love, you got to be saved. And so he says the fruit of the Spirit, number one, is love. And then there's joy. Joy is not dependent upon happenings. Well, I have, this happened to me, so I have joy. No, this happened to you, so you're happy. But you can still have joy in prison. Paul and Silas did what? Complained in prison? Well, they sang praises, didn't they? So they had the joy of the Lord even while they were in prison. So happiness is because of what they say happenstance is because of happenings. Happenings will make you happy. But joy is from within. It's only what God can give you. And happiness is based upon happenings. And then we have peace. We have love. We have joy. And then we have peace regardless of what takes place. Are you listening? Regardless of what takes place in the next few weeks, the next month or so, we can still have peace. Regardless of the problems, there is a deep inward sense of rightness with God. You better make sure you're right with God no matter what happens. If you're right with God, then you can have the peace of God, which does what? Passeth 
all understanding. And so we have these three, love, joy, peace. That is God word. And then we have those next three has to do with our relationship to one another, man word. What do we do uh, with man? Well, first of all, he talks about long suffering. It means to suffer long. In some case, it means to suffer real long. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and, and so long suffering. It's to have patience with people. I just dealt with that, didn't I? I just told on myself, didn't I? It's to have patience with people. Uh, do we have patience with people? Sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. You know, I, I'm sure Lou, Lou is pastored and uh, Brother Bill's pastored, and I'm sure they have preached on a subject year after year after year, and you have that one that comes to you and says, Preacher, could you tell me about, uh, let me give you an example, eternal security. Yeah. I don't know how you could believe in eternal security. Look, look, and you preached on it for years and years and years, and you're thinking, did you not listen did you not hear? Did you not read? Did you not open up your heart to the scriptures? But I'm going to tell you, sometimes it takes a long time for people to grasp that thing. And all of a sudden they say, man, I see it now. And I'm thinking, why didn't you see it when you first saw it? <laughs> but you know what? God has more patience and is more long suffering than we are. In fact, the Bible says he's long suffering to usward. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So we have long suffering. That's our part to one another. And then there's gentleness. Gentleness. It, it, it's kindness. It's just being kind to other people. You know, that doesn't take a, a whole lot to do, does it? To, just to be kind to people. But I'm telling you what, when people are unkind to you, it's hard to be kind to them. Sometimes you wish that you could live a, a, back in the law. You know, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. <laughs> Sometimes you want to get that way. But the Bible talks about being kindness. And that's the fruit of the Spirit, that kindness. We need that. And then goodness. Goodness. You know, the Bible says that Barnabas was a good man. You know, there's a, you know what goodness is? Goodness, biblically speaking, is simply uprightness of life and character. Just, just being what you ought to be for the Lord. I mean, there are just some things, there are just some things you ought to do because it's the right thing to do and because as a Christian, you ought to do it. And God gives you the power to do that. Uprightness, goodness, just being good to people. You know, that's, that, that will win people over before they hear you preach. Before they hear you witness, if you're not good to people. By the way, that's why some of these liberal churches are getting crowds. Because the people are good to people coming in. They just don't have any good doctrine. And then there's people who just has the doctrine. You know, we know you're going to go to hell if you don't get saved. And that's true. But you got to be good to people. Yeah. You got to be good to people. Yeah. And uh, you can win people. Look, Jesus was good to people, wasn't he? I mean, you think about the people he dealt with one-on-one. -on -one. He was good to them. He was good to that woman at the well, wasn't he? He, he didn't say, I know you've had five husbands. I, I know you, you're living in adultery right now. I know what, no, he was just good to her. He good to her. And, and, and because he was good to her, the Holy Ghost of God convicted her of her sin. Because she said, come, come and see a man that told me all things whatsoever I did. Now, Jesus just told her a few things that she did. Not all things, but man, she was under the power, conviction of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And by the way, when Philip had that great, uh, I think it's in Acts chapter 6, when he was having that uh, uh, revival in Samaria, I guarantee you she had part to do with that because of the change in her life. Those people in Samaria, Samaria saw her change and Philip just preaching. So there's one of God's converts. There's one of Jesus's converts. So goodness, it's uprightness of life and character. And then we have the inward. We have Godward, love, joy, peace. We have, uh, we have inward, uh, we have manward. And uh, that was what? Long suffering, gentleness, goodness, and then the inward part. That's the part that's in us. The inward part, faith. We ought to have faith. What is faith? Well, we know the faith come up by hearing, hearing by the word of God, but I'm talking about something a little different here. Faith. Faith. Um, 
It talks, it, it really means dependability, trustworthiness. Do you have faith in some people? Yeah, you do. Do you have faith in all people? No, you don't. Uh, look, as a pastor, and some of you have pastor churches, you know, <clears throat> you know who you can depend on. And you know who you can't depend on. So sometimes, <laughs> well, maybe I might be getting myself in trouble here. <laughs> but but I'm, just, I'm just going to tell you, there's some people you can call on to help you out in the situation, and you know they're going to be there. Yeah. And then there's some people that you can't depend on it, so you don't even ask them. Yeah. That's, right. Come on. Well, that's the truth. Look, like Daddy used to say, I'm telling the truth if I've ever told it before. <laughs> I'm, telling, I'm telling it right now. <laughs> so, so uh, faith, dependability. Boy, don't you, like, don't you like people that you can depend upon? If they say, I'll be there, you can count on it. Ed, Eddie used to say, he, he said, if I tell you tomorrow's Christmas, hang up your Christmas stocking. He said, go ahead and hang it up. He said, dependability, trustworthiness. And then he talks about meekness. You know what meekness is? not being weak, but it is power under control. Now, I, I, I was reading this today. You remember Moses. The Bible says that Moses was very meek. I think that was in Numbers 13. Moses was very meek. Now, that's what it says. Above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. You know what happens in chapter 14? They have a committee meeting. <laughs> Someone says, some of them went to the land of Canaan, spied out, then came back and says, well, oh, we can't do that. We, we, they're too big. They're, we're just like grasshoppers in their sight. Two of them said, we can do it. And 10 of them said, we can't do it. And Moses just flew off the handle. <laughs> so, <laughs> I tell you, a committee meeting will do it every time. Say amen right there. <laughs> so, Moses was meek, very meek. And then temperance. Temperance. That's a good word. Somebody, <clears throat> some people say, well, temperance, in some of these funny Bibles, it says self-control. But temperance is moderation, restrained indulgence. That's Webster's Dictionary. It means patience, calmness, sedateness. Not excessive. Now, some of it, I've heard people say, well, it means self-control. That's our problem. We're controlling ourselves <laughs> instead of letting God control us. Instead of what? Yielding and said, Lord, you help me. You control me. And uh, you take my life. And then he says here in verse number 23, meekness, tempers, against such there is no law. Now, you don't need a law when this lifestyle is characteristic in your life, when you have these nine things that he talks about, three toward God, three toward one another, and three toward yourself, you don't need no law to tell you how to live. Now, I'm glad we have a Bible. But if the Holy Spirit is living in me, I'm supposed to love you because that's my characteristic. It's God's in me. Love's in me. I ought to have long suffering toward you. Why? Because God lives in me. The Spirit of God lives in me. I don't need to carry around a bunch of three by five cards and say, you know what? I'm going to Walmart here. Let's see what these. I got to look at one of these, what I'm going to have to have. God tells me in my heart what I need, how to treat people, how not to treat people, how to be kind, uh, and, and so forth. So when you practice these graces, you fulfill the law. So we have the conflict that we saw, and we have the contrast that's been given. Now, look, let's look at the last thing here. Verse 24, 25, and 26. We're going to see the conquest here, the conquest. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory provoking one another. By the way, I think it's Hebrews that tells us that we can provoke one another, but to love. Provoking one another and to love. But here he says, provoking, uh, let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Now, 
he's going to talk about two things in verse number 25. Verse number 25 says, if we live in the spirit, all right, living in the spirit has to do with salvation. You say, well, why do you say that? Because before we got saved, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Now that you're saved, you're living. Boy, are you ever living? If you're saved, man, you, 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 you've never had a life like that before. You're really living. You have, look, you have his life, Christ's life in you. You never had that before. You were simply existing. You were simply going from one day to the next day. Boredom. Doing the same things. All, but I'm telling you now that you're saved. That inward man is renewed day by day. Though the outward man perish, we know that, don't we? Yet that inward man is renewed day by day. And so living in the spirit has to do with salvation. You can't live it until you have it. Amen. And then I like verse 25 again. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Now that has to do with our sanctification. Walking in the spirit. Doing what God wants us to do. Now when you look at that word walk, it's different from the word walk in verse number 16. Look at verse 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then right before he closes this, this chapter, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Now I have, I, I like, I like looking up words and I look them up in Strong's concordance. If you don't have one, you ought to get you one. And I think I've got two or three. If you need one, I'll give you one. And maybe some down here at the, the, the mission house. I try to start a little library down there. Try to start one here and there. Anyway, the word walk is different from the word walk in verse number 16. Now, listen. The word walk in verse number 16 means to walk around, to tread, to tread around by means of the Spirit. Can I say that again? To walk around by the means of the spirit. You can't walk without the spirit. But here's a different word in verse number 25. The word walk here means it talk it, it means a military rank. It has to do with mil, it has to do with marching. And you know how you march? You just don't walk around anywhere you want to walk. You take one step, one right in front of the other, marching. That's what that word means. It means to walk in military rank. It means to keep in step. It means to put one foot in front of the other. Now listen, the key to living under the control of the spirit of the, of the living God is just like learning to walk. How do you learn to walk? Just one step at a time. Now, let me show you something, and I'm glad she's here tonight. Kelly, would you come here for a second? <laughs> Kelly was, <laughs> when, let's step right here. Kelly, when she was born, she couldn't walk. Y'all believe that? <laughs> she crawled around a lot, but one day, and she's a lot taller than she was back then. <laughs> but one day, when we were teaching her to walk, she would hold her hands up, Right? She would hold her, turn this way. She would hold her hands up. And I would put my finger here, and she would hold my finger. And she would take one step at a time, one step at a time. And if it looked like she was getting ready to fall, I'd grab her arms like that. In fact, she would hold my fingers, but I still had her, okay? One step at a time, one step at a time. And you know what? There came a time she got a little bit brave. So she let go and started walking two or three steps. And then what happened? Boom. You fell down. All right, thanks. Now, that's the way you walk with God. Yeah. You say, what do you mean? Uh, just one foot at a time. You don't hold on to God for salvation. But you hold on to him, so to speak, when you're walking in sanctification. Yeah. Are you listening? You know what happens to you and me? When we say, okay, God, I can do this by myself, you fall flat on your face. And so walking with God, it's not that you hold on. You know, God holds on to us. We know that. 
But I'm telling you what, we don't hold on to God for salvation, but, but you hold on when you're learning how to walk. And if you think you're going to walk without God, he'll let you try it. And you'll fall flat on your face. How many of you have ever done that before? Yeah. How many of you have said, you know, God, I got this. You know, that's the thing they say now, right? I got this. I got this. Oh, yeah, okay. Let's see if you do. God will let you do that. And then you'll find out you don't got this. <laughs> so there are days when you're walking in victory. I maybe say amen right there. There are days you're just walking in victory. And then there are days when you fall in defeat. Amen. We've all done that. But there are days when you allow the spirit to control your life. And there are days when you decide you're going to do this thing yourself. And when you fail to yield to the Holy Spirit of God, to the life of God, you're going to fall. So what do you do, preacher? You brush yourself off and you get up again yeah. and you start walking. Now, listen, I thought about this today. In Hebrews, the Bible says lifting up holy hands. All right. And uh, I thought, you know, that's the way the Jew prayed. He didn't pray like this, like we do and bow our heads and close your eyes and fold your hands. The Jew didn't pray like that. We pray that way. But the Jew would lift up his eyes, his face toward heaven with his eyes open. And he would extend his hands like this to say, Lord, I'm asking you for this. And like, you, you, you know, you're expecting him to put something in here. Yeah. But I thought about this. When he says lifting up holy hands, that may be an acknowledgement that, Lord, I can't do this by myself. You've got to you take my hands and walk me. Yeah. Yeah. I thought about that. Maybe it means that too. It's a good thought anyway. But so, so we fail, and when we fail to walk with God, God doesn't do away with us. He said, just get up, brush yourself off, repent, and let's go. And if you'll li lift your hands toward him, he'll grab a hold of your hands. And he said, I want you to walk with me, but you, don't, you can't get ahead of me. You can't get ahead of me because you'll fall and you'll fail. Does not the Bible say, he leadeth me. In paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Sometimes he'll lead us that we may follow. Sometimes he'll just hold our hands and let us take one step at a time. I like those times, don't you? Because when, when he's holding your hands, you're holding him. Boy, what sweet fellowship you can have. But there's no fellowship when you've fallen. <laughs> there's no fellowship when you're just out on your own. And you're going to do it your way. You think about it. Think about that. When you go your own way, you're not going to be talking to God. You've left him back there. And he'll say, okay, let's see what happens. So I'm thankful that God says that we can walk with him if we desire that. But if we don't want to walk with God, he'll, he'll step out of the way. Let you make a mess of yourself. Yeah. Peter did, didn't he? Peter made a mess of himself, but Jesus reclaimed him back on the shores of the Galilee, didn't he? I'm glad that God gives you second chance, third chance, fourth chance, fifth chance, and he just keeps going on and on and on. So remember that fruit of the spirit to Godward, to manward, and then that inward part. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, we love you. Tonight... We ask, dear God, that we would examine our walk. We know that we walk in the Spirit, and if we do that, we'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But Lord, there's a, there's a walk, there's a walk that we must have that we realize we can't walk without you. The old songwriter had it right when he said, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. So, Father, we ask, dear God, that we would not run off, do things our own way, as individuals, as churches, even as a nation. We ask, dear God, that you'll help us to wait upon thee. Please use us now. If there's one here that needs to be saved, would you please save them? We do ask it in Christ's wonderful and blessed name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together.